Hi, this is your host, Andrew Rafael, the founder and CEO of Baintree Wealth Advisors. And I want to welcome you to the Your Wealth and Beyond podcast, a show that was created to help you simplify the financial world and to ensure that you're living your best life now and in retirement. Each show, we're going to be bringing on experts that are going to help you build wealth and most importantly, find purpose in what matters most. Welcome listeners to a brand new episode of Your Wealth and Beyond. And today's show is going to be crucial for all of us. Cybersecurity, identity theft, ransomware, phishing emails, the list goes on and on and it affects all of us. So today we're bringing on Steve Weissman, a nationally recognized expert in all things scams, identity theft, cybersecurity. His entire career has been built upon helping to educate us on what we can do to protect ourselves both online and off. He is the author of multiple books, one of which is The Identity Theft Alert and How to Avoid Scams. And he's just the go-to expert in helping us identify the risks that are out there. So today we're going to dig in. We don't want to depress you, but we've got to really have open communication of what's out there, what the thieves and the criminals are doing, and some of the ways and how you can protect yourself. So without further ado, my episode with Steve Weissman on ways and how you can protect your identity both online and off. And welcome back to a brand new episode of Your Wealth and Beyond. I want to welcome Steve Weissman to the show. Steve, how are you today? Terrific. And uh, today, listeners, we are going to talk all things on how to protect each and every one of you from identity theft to the different cybersecurity scams that are going. As we enter here, the holidays, some of the things to look for. I think we're going to have a lot of great, great topics to weed through here. So Steve, before we jump in, how have you become the go-to cybersecurity identity theft? Um, I mean, where did this career come from? How did you get to this point? You know, I, it's an interesting question. I, I, I think I probably trace it back. I've always been uh, interested in, in crime and uh, criminals. And in fact, uh, before I, I, I'm, I'm a lawyer, but I'm also a professor at Bentley University in uh, Massachusetts, where I teach white collar crime. Uh, but I, before that, I actually taught in the, the Massachusetts state prison system and met a lot of interesting con men there. But I think what did it for me was many years ago when I became a victim of identity theft at a gym. My locker was broken into, uh, some identifying information was stolen out of my wallet, and uh, I, I became the, the first victim that I was aware of. And Got very interested in seeing where it went from there, and uh, that just uh, carried me into uh, identity theft, scams, cybersecurity, uh, both on a, a macro and a micro. I mean, this is a it's a problem for all of us as individuals. It's a major problem uh, for the country in regard to cybersecurity and attacks against financial institutions, electrical grid. Uh, it's a, it's an exciting topic. Yeah, I don't think there's a week that goes by where there's not something in the news that affected, you know, locally or, or nationally. And the thieves are getting smarter and smarter, right? It's that cat and mouse. How do we stay on top of it? And I guess for you, that keeps your career moving along and uh, you very busy out there. Yeah, it's, you know, it is interesting. There, there's always something. And you talk about the thieves and the, how smart they are. First of all, you know, cyber crime like ransomware and identity theft can be done by anyone anywhere in the world. And at one time, uh, Interpol, uh, once estimated that there were only about a hundred cyber criminal geniuses in the world. But what they do is the business plan is fascinating. They will create this malware that uh, will attack us, institutions, government agencies, whatever. And they will uh, either do massive data breaches with it and then go on to a part of the uh, Internet called the dark web where the bad guys buy and sell things. And they'll sell that information. Other times they'll create this new malware. And again, on these dark websites, some of them, uh, they look like regular retail uh, sites. One of them is called Joker's Stash. They will lease or sell their goods to less sophisticated cyber criminals. And that's, that's part of the problem. You don't need to be a cyber criminal genius to attack people with all kinds of malware. You just buy it online. And when we look at the mistakes that you've seen over the years, and especially now, 
Let's just talk through on the individual. What are some of the common mistakes that they're making in regards to protecting their online identity, in regards to protecting their offline identity with regards to credit cards and so forth? So what are some of the two or three top mistakes people are making right now? You know, yeah, interesting enough, Andrew, the, the biggest mistake of all, and you, you go back to my motto. My motto is, trust me, you can't trust anyone. <laughs> About 90% of uh, all of the major data breaches, as well as personal identity theft, can be traced back to phishing and more sophisticated spear phishing. And what these are are emails or text messages that appear to come from uh, either a person we trust or some institution with which we're involved, and there's some kind of emergency or lure for us to click on a link. Well, we click on that link and it downloads the malware onto our phone, downloads the malware onto our computer, and that's where a lot of problems happen. So the first thing, the first lesson is you never click on a link or download an attachment on the you absolutely have confirmed that it is indeed accurate. That is the biggest, most avoidable problem. I'll tell you one other very important one, and particularly now in the in the holiday season where people will be doing a lot of uh, shopping, both online and offline, do not use your debit card for anything other than an ATM card. And the reason for this is if you use your credit card and it's somehow uh, grabbed by the bad guys and fraudulent use is, is done of it uh, with it. Um, you're only liable for up to $50 worth of fraudulent charges. And quite frankly, I've never seen a credit card company that even charged that. But with your debit card, which is tied directly to a bank account of yours, if you end up getting becoming a victim of identity theft and they get that number and you don't report your debit card theft right away, you can actually end up losing your entire bank account. So keep that debit card just as an ATM card. And if you think about it, would there even be, you know, you could actually just get an ATM card with your bank. Would that be something you'd recommend is not even have a debit card and just have an ATM card for the sole purpose of being able to take money out of the bank? I would. Uh, I, I really would. There have been so many problems where people have uh, just not followed up on uh, on monitoring the their account usage, and afterward it's it's too late. And it's it's very easy to get these uh, the uh, the debit card numbers, and criminals get these all the time. So yeah, I would I would agree with your recommendation. And Steve, let's go back to what you mentioned first. And uh, obviously, the phishing emails have been around a while, and they're getting more and more professional. It's amazing what we get here on our, both my business email as well as the regular personal email. But it is, it's amazing now when you get something coming from PayPal, looks like, or Netflix now, or Apple. So one way that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but is this a good way to be able, as you say, don't click on anything, don't click on anything, but you can put your mouse over the link and normally what will happen is that hyperlink that will pop up will show you some really funky type of web address, right? And at that point, you know, this is for sure a phishing email. Yeah, that's one of the uh, the ways to uh, avoid this. And here again, y- you mentioned what the what they do is, first of all, I mentioned how I, I taught in the uh, state prisons and uh, way back when uh, the, the old con men, they used to complain or they complain now, they say, you know, when we were doing the con, it took and counterfeiting, it took talent. Now any 14 year old kid can do it with a computer. And so when you get a phishing or spear phishing email and spear phishing is just phishing that's more targeted toward you. Um, and you see the logo from Netflix, you see the logo from PayPal. It can look legitimate, but it's really easy to counterfeit. So as you say, you can hover over the uh, address there to see, uh, you know, who's re- where it's really going. You also can look as, at the address that, uh, that sent it. And sometimes it will have nothing to do it all with that company. And very often what that is, is it's part of a botnet because the bad guys to hide their tracks, they will infect millions of computers around the world and use those computers to send out the uh, the phishing and spear phishing. You know, another thing is, you know, it's one thing when, if I get an email from uh, a company that I don't deal with, a bank that I don't have an account with, you know, right away, I know it's a scam. But sometimes they will have personal information about you to make it seem legit. Or it may even be an email from uh 
that looks like a friend, but their account may have been hacked. And part of the problem is us. We put too much information up on social media. And so that information can be grabbed by criminals and turned against us. You know, the, the infamous grandparents scheme, uh, where the, uh, the grandparents get a call in the middle of the night from uh, a child who's in Mexico and is having a problem on vacation and has to wire money or worse, send gift cards. One of the ways that that is, is perpetrated is the, the scammers will be going on social media. They'll see when the college kid is uh, putting up about their vacation in Cancun or whatever. So we have to be a little bit more thoughtful about how could the information we put up be used against us? Yeah, and we, unfortunately, as a planning firm and with hundreds of clients, just over the last year, we've seen an uptick in clients that have been actually falling for some of these scams. You know, the old, uh, what, what I think, if you go back to social media, what one's just happened is they're able to find somebody who may be lonely, who may have lost their husband. Yeah. And now they're creating these deep relationships with, and it's amazing, no matter what we tell them, and we'll tell them this is a scam. This is a scam. Go and then go, you know, you can look it up. You could go talk to your local government, but they're sending money and they're making up these concocted stories and it's preying on the lonely. And it starts with Facebook. And you guys just got to be careful out there of what you're putting on and then who you're creating these relationships with. Yeah, I mean, very, very much so. The, the romance scams that you describe, and it's not just here, it's a, totally around the world. I just saw some uh, figures in Hong Kong where it's uh, particularly bad. And yes, it preys on lonely, vulnerable people. And that's it. It's one thing about the scam artists. And remember, these people are the only criminals we call artists. They have a knowledge of psychology that Freud would have envied. And so they'll appeal to whatever works. It can be loneliness. It, it can be a little bit of greed. It can be fear. Uh, it can it can be any of these things. And indeed, uh, it is surprising to me uh, how many and really, really intelligent people will have those vulnerabilities exploited and uh, become victims. The romance scams are actually have been people who uh, committed. There was a case out in the Midwest where uh, someone kept sending money and his family kept learning about it and telling him, don't do this. Eventually, he committed suicide and left a note saying, you're all going to really be, uh, you know, feeling bad when you find out that I, I, I there, this was a real deal and it wasn't just me. Unbelievable. Yeah. And it's um, when we think about what's happening out there, you've mentioned you mentioned earlier about, you know, besides the fishing so now we've got to be worried about our iPhone and Android. So talk us through about what we should be looking for in these text messaging scams that are happening now. Yeah, and this is one of the things. At one time, uh, people thought they were they were safer on uh, their uh, iPhones rather than their Androids. And at one time, they were probably correct that there was uh, more attention paid by cyber criminals to uh, the uh, Android phones than the iPhones. But now it. it Equal opportunity scams. They are both vulnerable. So one of the first things is, you know, people will often have uh, all kinds of good security software on their computer or their laptop, but fail to put it on their phone. And that's important. You also have to make sure that your your phone, because phones can get, get lost as well. You don't want to store too much sensitive information on there. You want to make sure you've got a, a good, strong password thumbprint, whatever. Uh, these are these are all important. And of course, we spend so much of our lives on our phone uh, that this is where the scammers come in. Instead of uh, phishing, they call it smishing. And smishing uh, just basically is a phishing email. Now it's a text message that comes into a text message with a link. And here's one of the things we're talking about, you know, have the most up-to-date security software. And up-to-date is definitely the key because what happens is it's, it's security is ever-evolving. And uh, I was I was actually asked to, to be a uh, an expert witness in a class action uh, against Equifax regarding the data breach that affected 148 million of us, including me. And the thing with the Equifax data breach was it exploited, the data breach exploited a vulnerability in a software called Apache that Equifax used. There had been a security update issued months before uh, the actual hacking. 
the hacking exploited that vulnerability, but Equifax just hadn't gotten around to downloading it, and it was extremely negligent. So the, the two of the things here are, one, when you do get a notice to update your software, update your security software right away, whenever, whatever you're using. But the other thing is, the most up-to-date security software will always be at least 30 days behind the latest new types of malware. They call these zero-day defects. The brilliant cyber criminals identify these, and then they put them out there because people aren't going to be protected by their security software. So you have to have security software on all your devices. You have to have it updated. But even then, you've got to be particularly careful because it won't be 100% effective. Yeah, you think about it, you've worked with them in the prison system, some of these con artists, how smart they are. And you just think if they put their mind to actually good work, what they could have built (laughs) and companies they could have built and careers they could have had, it's amazing. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that, Andrew, because the... uh, the smart, and I, I've met I've met all kinds of uh, interesting people throughout my career, and government officials, and and all. And the smartest person I've ever met was a professional chess playing bank robber uh, in prison, and uh, he used the name. Uh, his name was Dale Tuttle, but he used the alias Andrew Goodman so he could sign uh, everything a good man, and uh, he would go around the country. Uh, he would be robbing banks and uh, playing in chess tournaments. He tried to convince me that uh, bank robbery was a victimless crime, that he created, let's say, he created jobs in security. Uh, he never hurt anybody. Companies uh, paid for this with insurance. He said, no, victimless crime. Unbelievable. It's, uh, well, there's a little bit of truth to that. He created an industry, <laughs> you know. <Yeah. laughs> That's great. And um, the yeah, tax season, although it's not here, it's coming quickly. And I, I got a lot of these calls and we actually had one client call us thinking that literally the IRS was going to come and arrest her. The police were on the way. So uh, as we prepare for tax season, what is that scam in regards to whether it's uh, an email from the IRS or these robocalls that are actually calling consumers and saying that they're basically behind on their taxes or that they broke the law and they're putting that fear into them? Yeah, and this is a is certainly a uh, a huge problem. Uh, and uh, but there's a a pretty easy solution. And here again, they they prey on our on our fear and concerns here. If you get a a phone call and your caller ID says IRS, you can't trust it. A very very simple easy technique called spoofing will allow anyone to make the call appear as if it's coming from another number. So you may get a a number that's the actual IRS number. Number. You may it may say IRS on there, but it isn't the IRS calling. So how do you know if it is or not? And uh, fortunately, the answer is is an easy one. The IRS does not initiate any contact with you regarding tax matters, mess, uh, tax matters, by either phone, text message, or email. So any any time you get a call from someone purporting to be the IRS demanding that you pay some uh, taxes or whatever. It's a scam and you can just ignore it. Great info there. And I actually use a uh, software on my iPhone called RoboCaller yep. and a RoboKiller, I believe it is. And it's great because it actually has about 25 different messages that once it knows, you know, that it is a RoboCall and it could be actually an individual, but then they've got these messages where it puts them like they're talking to somebody and it's great because it records it <laughs> and we can laugh at it afterwards. That's terrific. Yes. And, you know, robocalls are one of the uh, the biggest areas of scams. And these are the automated uh, calls and uh, they're made through computers and not even made through uh, phones. And uh, here again, what you should do, first of all, you may want to get on the federal do not call list, uh, which will prevent legitimate telemarketers from contacting you. One of the things with that is if you get a call from someone purporting to be from a bank or a timeshare or whatever, after you're on the do not call list, you know automatically uh, that uh, it's a scam because they're not following the, the do not call list. Beyond that, there are a lot of programs like you mentioned and also No More Robo and many others uh, that will help screen from uh, robocalls from your uh, your phone, and uh, I use them. They're they're not again. They're, nothing's one hundred percent effective, but they are very very good and worthwhile. 
Yeah, with that spoofing, now I get more and more of them where it shows that 480, that Phoenix area code. So, you know, every time that happens, it comes through and then I'll block it. So it's just continually like a, a boat sinking in the holes and covering one hole and then having to block another one. Yeah, it's playing whack-a-mole. So great point on the IRS. They are not going to contact you. They're going to only do it via mail. But the one thing that is real are these thieves that are filing tax returns before the actual individual does. And that's a real crime and it's happening. So what can we do to protect ourselves from that happening where they're collecting and having the refund check go to a a bank or to, in most cases, another mailbox that they're collecting those funds? Yeah. uh, Income tax identity theft is a huge, huge problem. And it costs, it costs us as taxpayers, uh, billions and billions of dollars a year. Uh, it is tremendously inconveniencing, uh, for the legitimate individual taxpayer too. And what happens is, is, as you alluded to, Andrew, it's, um, the, uh, the criminal gets your social security number, uh, and they file an income tax return before you get a chance to. Now, they're not actually even looking for your refund. What they're going to do is they're going to make a counterfeit uh, W-2 to send in with their uh, tax uh, their tax return or your tax return and get that money. So what happens is if that if they do have your social security number, if they do send this uh, in and get the, uh, the a refund, you file your legitimate tax return and uh, suddenly you are contacted by the IRS. There is a letter and it tells you that uh, there's been a duplicate return. You have to go through all of the uh, the procedures to try and prove that it is you and to get your legitimate refund. And frankly, although the IRS has gotten better with this, it can still be uh, close to a year before you can uh, get your your uh, your legitimate refund. And so one of the, the most important things uh, is to file your return as early as possible. And uh, that's that's probably the best thing you can do. Interestingly enough, on the uh, on the black market for social security numbers, the most valuable social security numbers to uh, income tax identity thieves are those of uh, citizens of Puerto Rico. And the reason for that is that citizens of Puerto Rico are American citizens, but they are not required to pay federal income taxes. So they will have social security numbers, but they won't be filing a federal income tax return. So in this way, the uh, uh, the income tax identity thief knows there's not going to be another income tax return filed before they file theirs. Wow, that's... uh devious planning there. And I did not know that. So that's an interesting tidbit there. So I've been hearing more and more on ransomware, right? And it's affecting a lot of these municipalities and they're kind of going after this lower hanging fruit. So let's talk about two things. One, again, as we're dealing more with individuals and business owners on the Your Wealth and Beyond podcast, is ransomware something that we as individuals and business owners have to be worried about? Yes, absolutely. All of the above. Ransomware in the last year has become the most prevalent uh, malware, and it it really does create a, a huge problem. We've heard about there were a number of municipalities in Texas, for instance, that were all hit by it looked like the, the same one. There have been hospitals. There have been cities like Atlanta and Baltimore that have been shut down. There have been police departments. But receiving a bit less uh, as far as uh, news coverage has been the fact that a lot of small businesses and we as individuals also are attacked by ransomware. So how ransomware works is you, again, click on that link in that uh, tainted email and uh, you end up downloading the malware that is called ransomware. This ransomware will encrypt and lock up all of your data. And then appearing on your screen is the ransom demand that either you pay, and generally it's by some kind of cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, uh, a ransom within usually about 48 hours, or they will destroy all of your data. This is a huge problem. Now, you can never be 100% secure. So what I always advise people is, yes, you've got to keep your, uh, uh, your security software up to date with the latest security updates. And this is particularly important because there have been criminals using older strains of uh, ransomware that you do have defenses against. But even uh, even beyond doing that, you've got to back up regularly uh, on at least 
two other sources, maybe in the cloud and a portable hard drive, all of your data regularly. So if you do become a victim, uh, then you can uh, you can retrieve your uh, your information. A, a couple of uh, quick stories with this. One, and I saw this was one that was going around to individuals, was a ransomware strain with a Star Trek theme. And it would use all of this Star Trek jargon telling you that uh, you had become a victim of ransomware. Once you pay, if you paid uh, the uh, the ransom, uh, Mr. Spock would come on and he would give you the uh, the key. But uh, I'll tell you, I, I, I was working over the summer with a uh, with a company uh, that deals with ransomware for uh, large corporations. And uh, what happened was the uh, the person in this company it was representing a client. They had been hit with ransomware. And this guy contacts the uh, the criminals and said, OK, uh, first they tried to negotiate. Uh, and you sometimes you can the uh, the ransom, but then said, we need to sh- see you show some some good faith. So uh, give us the key to unlock some of our data so we can you know, know to trust you. So the uh, the criminals gave them the key. It didn't work. So the security people then told them it, it, uh, it this is not uh, this is not working, and uh, at that point the, uh, um, the the criminals we are so embarrassed and uh, let me check with our tech team and of course they checked with their tech team and tech support and got back okay try this key and then that key did work but they really are, are quite. Uh, they, they, they're, they're quite organized and this is a business for them. So if they're going to continue doing ransomware, they they have to show that they're giving a little support technically. Yeah. When that 60 minutes report I saw earlier this year, when it hit the uh, municipalities and a lot of hospitals, hospitals are huge, you know, they 40, 50,000, they paid it. A lot of them had the insurance to cover it and then they gave back the data. So you hit it right on the head there. If these uh, criminals did the ransom and then just took the money and ran, well, then they're shooting themselves in the foot there. So it sounds like they're pretty good business planners in regards to making sure that their business is going to excel. Yeah. You know, you mentioned something that, that uh, clicked off something in my mind, and, and that is about the the infamous, because uh, you were talking about insurance, the business email compromise. And this is a, a multi, multi-billion dollar uh, scam around the world. And what uh, the gist of it is, is it affects big, but also medium and small businesses. Uh, if someone gets an email that appears to come from uh, the, the CEO or someone else that to wire money into an account. And it's, it's dealing, maybe it's a, a customer who's changed their account number, whatever. There's, there's generally, it looks good and it's, Usually because the corporation has been hacked, the email account has been hacked of the, the CEO. So they even know perhaps when the person's on vacation. So they're not even going to be in the building when they, uh, they send the email. But here's, here's one of the things is, uh, and it's, it's kind of interesting. There have been companies that have, uh, tried to use their cyber insurance and in fact have been the claims have been denied in some instances these cases are being litigated because they're saying well you were not no one did a cyber attack on you and stole money you sent money on your own so uh, it's important to have insurance cyber insurance for uh, uh, companies and it's the kind of thing that uh, you've got to make sure you know what you get for coverage for individuals uh it is it is important to have uh some kind of identity theft protection uh service and you know we're familiar with lifelock and others but it's also important to remember that at the gist of it these are not identity theft prevention services so it's like you're you're crossing the street, you get hit by a bus, someone runs out and tells you as you're lying on the, on the ground, hey, you just got hit by a bus. That's lifelock. They will tell you sooner that you've become a victim of identity theft. So you do need to have the kind of monitoring that uh, companies uh, like lifelock provide. But even more so, you need to have uh, the take the steps like freezing your credit reports. This is one reason uh, I've endorsed a uh, an identity theft protection product called Identron. They're the only one out there that helps you set up credit freezes for yourself and your children. Your children are prime targets of identity theft. So that even if someone has your social security number, they're not going to be able to access uh, credit or set up accounts in your name. 
So your software is making it easier to do that credit freeze so that, you know, I think that's one of the issues as people look and say, yeah, I want to freeze my credit. I've got to contact the three bureaus. And then what if I want to apply for a loan or get a new car, those type of things. So how does your service make it a little bit easier and efficient for the individual? Yeah, what Identron does is uh, it takes you it takes you through it in one place, step by step, what you do, and, and clicks you on and takes you to uh, takes you directly to each of the three credit reporting agencies, and actually even a fourth uh, that deals only with uh, cell phones. But the you mentioned an important thing because the the uh, the credit reporting bureaus. Uh, they are, uh, they're big businesses. They never wanted us to freeze our credit because they make their money not from us. We're not with their customers. We're their product. They sell our information to banks, insurance companies and others. And that's, that's entirely legitimate. But when we freeze our credit, they can't send that and sell that, uh, information. So it is important and it's simple to do. It really is. It's, you can do it all for individuals, adults. You can do it online with children. You do have to, it's a little bit more complex, but it's really just by sending in like a certified copy of birth certificate and a few other, uh, documents. But here's the good thing. At, at one time, there used to be a charge when you froze. Then let's say you wanted to take out a loan. Um, recently I had to, uh, renew the lease on my, on my car. So I needed to unfreeze my credit so that the uh, the, l- the lender could look at it the and see what my credit was. Then once that was uh, the business transaction was completed, freeze it again. Well, the good thing is where they used to charge you to freeze and unfreeze and freeze again, a federal law that went into effect a year ago in September now makes that totally free. And it's simpler to do. So when I went on to unfreeze my credit so that the creditor could uh, check out my credit report. I had it unfrozen for 48 hours. So at the end of the 48 hours, I didn't even have to go back in to refreeze it. It did it automatically. So the laws have gotten much better on this. And frankly, they, they did this in response to the, uh, the major Equifax data breach. So if there was anything good that came out of it, that was this. And then you mentioned earlier, and I was going to bring it up, uh, LifeLock, or for me, I actually, I utilize LifeLock and Identity Guard. So that is from the standpoint of what we can do to help protect us. Is that a must for people to spend that money each month to be able to at least know if your credit has been used or there's been a change in your file? Yeah, I, you know, I think it is, you know, on the, on the one hand, and my thinking kind of evolved on this. At one time, you could check your, you can check your credit report for free and, uh, at each of the three major credit reporting agencies once a year. And one of the things he used to advise is tell people, well, do it, uh, at Equifax and then four months later, uh, do it at Experian, then four months later, do it, uh, at TransUnion. And that way you've got them, uh, every four months. But, the, the fees for these services like Identron, like LifeLock and others, uh, they're, 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 I think they're worth it because what happens is you have it, you have your credit constantly monitored. Uh, most of these services also will check the dark web to see if your personal information, your social security number, uh, has been part of any data breach and is out there and is being sold. So there are, uh, the credit monitoring is a, a big deal. Uh, but there are other services that also are provided. And uh, it's part of all of the prudent things we need to do to protect ourselves. But yeah, I, I, I do think it's something uh, that everyone should have. And like with Adentron, you guys are able to, uh, you know, you mentioned dark web earlier. And that's the one thing that in regards to us not knowing that our email was maybe compromised. So what are you able to do then? You're able to search the dark web or is it more so to see like what companies got affected? And then how does it work backwards to know that your email potentially was out there or your credit information was out there? How are you guys scanning the dark web or how is it scanned? Yeah. And that's it. We have, uh, we have uh, access to the dark web and uh, therefore we, we are able to scan it to see if uh, our credit cards, our social security numbers, or other personal information turn up. And, and you mentioned about, you know, what about with, with companies in just about every major data breach, uh, the, you go back with, with Target and others, um, the companies themselves do not discover that uh, they've been the victim of data breaches. It's usually 
credit card companies, which are themselves constantly monitoring the dark web. And so what they will do is they will find a lot of credit cards, a lot of debit cards that are uh, being sold on the dark web. And uh, these banks and credit card companies, will they will then correlate, okay, what do these have in common? And then they can trace it back to, aha, this was a uh, security data breach uh, at, at Wendy's. And then they will contact Wendy's and knowing what they're looking for, they'll be able to find the uh, the actual data breach in there. But it is often through the monitoring of the dark web most of the time uh, that these major data breaches are discovered. The companies don't discover them on their own. Okay, great. So besides writing a multitude of books, your website, and I love this name, and I guess this goes back to your passion of the, uh, you know, when you started out in homicide, but Scamicide, and this will be in the show notes, everybody. So Scamicide was created by you, and it looks like more than anything, it's to help each of the uh, individuals or help us to stay on top of some of the scams as total and then the different trending scams. So it seems like you're updating it almost daily on some of the scams that are affecting us. Yeah, it's it's actually scam is kind of like one stop shopping for defense uh, against scams. And it, it's it's free. And uh, one of the things is it is uh, it, I've been doing it uh probably about eight years. And when I first started, I was wondering if I was going to be able to find, because we have our scam of the day, a new one. And, you know, would I be able to find a new one every day? Well, I'm up around 3,000 individual scams. So we will we will tell people about scams, every, new scams every day. And very often we've, we've been ahead of the curve when it's uh, scams involving the Internet of Things or how your car can be hacked and your, your phone can be hacked. We also connect you with Sometimes when there are scams, the Federal Trade Commission is involved and they will actually refund money. So we have a section on there you can go to and we will let people know if you've been a victim of this scam, you can apply for checks here. So we warn people about what to do with identity theft and scams. And we also tell them uh, how to recognize them, how to defend against them and what to do if you have become a victim. And one of those trending right now, and for a lot of our clients who are getting closer in that Medicare, you know, 65 and older, what kind of scams should we be looking for in regards to open enrollment on Medicare and other scams associated with health in general? Yeah. And, you know, here again, probably health scams are the oldest of scams. And, you know, a lot of the scams are really not new anyway. They are, they are just reworking of uh, scams that have been with us forever. The Nigerian email scam is really just a reworking of a scam called the Spanish prisoner scam from the 1500s. But you're right. Uh, we are in the open enrollment period of Medicare, the only time of the year you can change your, your plans. And therefore, there are all kinds of scams is contacting uh, people out there about programs uh, that they are eligible for. And it's really hard to know if they are legitimate or not. And, you know, in covering this uh, in Scamicide, we, you know, give some information about how to do this, including, frankly, the, the Medicare website. They, uh, the Medicare website is uh, of the uh, uh, federal government is a really good website that you could go on and find what programs are available to you in your area. Uh, there also is is a, it's an acronym, uh, I think it's called SHIP, uh, S-H-I-P, and these are localized uh, federal organizations that will help you to see which are scams and which are not. One thing, again, you never give your uh, social security number or Medicare number, your Medicare number up until this year used to be your, your social security number. You never give that out oh, to anyone over the phone who is uh, asking for it because you just don't know who they really are. You also have to be wary of, this is something that we've seen in a lot of areas where there are seniors. People will come and uh, say, we will get you free medical equipment. We just need your Medicare number. And then they're defrauding Medicare, but they're also using that uh, against your insurance. And when you need it, suddenly it's been used and it's been used fraudulently. So uh, always be very, very wary. Don't get that free equipment that just someone at a health fair is offering you merely for your uh, Medicare number. Great points. You know, this new one, it's scaring the daylights out of me. I mean, I think it's going to get more and more play, but you would go back to the iPhones, right? And now most of these have these SIM cards that are attached to it. And the SIM card 
kind of controls so many things, right, Steve? Because you think about how our email and our banking, what we use is if we lost our password, guess how the majority of us are using to reset that is our phone number, get the text message. So what most people don't realize and how this SIM card scam works, I know a lot of times they're looking at more of those that have the cryptocurrency wallet that they know they're going to try to scam them that way. But what is it and how can we protect ourselves as best we can? Obviously, we can't stop a scrupulous person within Verizon who's selling that data. But what are some things that we could do right now to help protect our cell phone SIM? Yeah, and this is one of the uh, biggest emerging areas of, of scams and major, major threats. So as you indicated, the, the SIM card is in the, the piece in your phone that really is the guts. It, it's your, it is your telephone number. And, you know, you get a new phone, you switch the SIM card from uh, that card, uh, from that phone to uh, another phone. One reason the SIM card is so important is uh, what we call dual factor authentication. So I, I give you an example. Uh, when Jennifer Lawrence uh, was a, uh, a victim of uh, having her nude photo stolen from the cloud, she was very, very upset. And uh, as you can obviously imagine, and she was very, very angry uh, with uh, Apple uh, because she said the iCloud was not secure. Well, the iCloud, the cloud was secure. She got a phishing email and it was a very basic one. It said, this is from Apple security. We just need to uh, confirm your username and password. So she gave it to him. So she, in fact, just gave it to the scammers so that they could go into her account. Many, many accounts, and particularly if you're doing something like online banking, you want to have protection more than just your username and password so that someone who gets these can't go into your account. So the way that's usually done is by having, when you go in, a one-time code is text messaged to your phone. And you then input that. Well, this is something, and I noticed, you know, and you, this kind of protection you have on your, with your uh, bank account, uh, for your online banking and other online accounts. Recently, I, I noticed the, uh, the head of Twitter, the CEO of Twitter had his Twitter account, uh, taken over. And I'm thinking, this guy's got to have dual factor authentication. He did. But when the bad guys have switched the SIM card, from your phone to their phone, when that text message to uh, provide the code to get into your bank account uh, is sent, it's sent to the bad guy's phone. So this is a real huge, huge problem. But as you indicated, there are some simple ways to protect yourself. And we have this uh, in Scamicide, we list with each of the uh, the cell phone providers, service providers, you can put a pin or a code on there so that even if someone has your, uh, they can't switch the SIM card into their phone unless they know your pin. The other thing you can even do is, because even paranoids have enemies, uh, you can make it such that your SIM card cannot be switched into another phone unless you are physically in the store to do so, where you can show a, a photo ID. But yes, having a, uh, a pin on your, uh, uh, on, your, on your SIM card is so, so important, and most people don't do it. I'll tell you one other thing that is a real important protection, simple to do, but uh, provides a great risk if you don't have it, is your security question. You know, what happens if you don't remember your uh, your password you get it wrong well you can merely answer a security question and get the password but this is easy enough for the hackers to do and sarah palin actually got her email hacked her security question was uh, you know where do where did i meet my husband uh the hacker uh, went on wikipedia and found out she met him at wasilla high school now we may say all right i'm not as famous as sarah palin my information is not going to be out there well it is. It's out there all over the place, including I have my bank has, you know, what is my mother's maiden name? Well, that's pretty easy to find out. So what do you do to make that a lock solid security question? You make the your mother's maiden name fire truck, grapefruit, credit card. You pick something that is absolutely, totally nonsensical. No criminal is ever going to be able to find that online. And it is so ridiculously silly, you will remember. Yeah, that's really good advice. And I've actually started using LastPass a couple of years ago, enabling me to help make these really long passwords and not have to remember all of them. 
Are you a fan of a last pass or some of the other first passwords that are the way where you can have all of your stuff out there, but it's completely protected and encrypted? Yeah. Here again, I, I, I kind of like having the, uh, my, as much control as I can. So yes, uh, the, these, uh, services that will provide, uh, you know, long encrypted passwords for you uh, can be very, very helpful for many people. I personally don't use them only because I see them as too much of a, uh, a target of the hackers. And uh, while there haven't been a lot of data breaches at some of these uh, services, there have been some. What I generally do is you, you, you cannot have the same password for all of your accounts because what happens is there's a, a data breach at some minor website that you're going to and you're using that also for your online banking. So suddenly they've got the password to your uh, bank account uh, as well. What I suggest is you've got to have a long, complex password. And I say start with a sentence, something like, I don't like passwords. You get capital letters, you get small letters, you get an apostrophe. Now, you can then make that stronger, add a couple of exclamation points at the end. That's your base. So my Amazon password might be, I don't like passwords, two exclamation points, AMA. So this is some way that you can have a base password that you can adapt and be able to remember for all of your accounts. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when you think in terms of, you know, beyond the security questions, the authenticators that are becoming more and more popular. I know I use the one from Google. Yeah. Should people start using that instead of their cell phone as a way to get into the more secure things like the banking or things of that nature. There are financial institutions like Fidelity and TD Ameritrade. Yeah, I agree that they're far from perfect, but they are a lot better than uh, the, you know, some of the dual factor authentications and other authentications we have uh, out there. So uh, the, the good guys are always playing catch up uh, with the bad guys. But in fact, that is uh, that's a good development. And uh, that's a good way of uh, providing some hygiene to your use of the uh, computers. So, you know, listeners, we didn't want to depress you today. We didn't want to scare you, <laughs> but we have to. And, you know, we've got to stay on our toes. And that's why you've got to follow Steve. And I'd say sign up for his blog on Scam Aside because you'll get emails to you on the latest trends. And you guys just have to be very, very vigilant in protecting your identity because nobody else is going to do it. And really, Steve, I thank you for doing the dirty work for us because without individuals and professionals like you, the thieves and the criminals are going to take over the world. So continue doing your good work, sir. I appreciate it. A quick story, and this is as far as depressing people uh, and not depressing people. When I was in prison uh, teaching, I had a student who had uh, was serving two consecutive life sentences, which meant when he died, he would start his second life sentence. I said, oh, I was curious about that. He said, me too. He said, when the judge sentenced me, I looked up at him. I said, how do you expect me to do two consecutive life sentences? <laughs> so the judge looked down and said, just do the best you can. So that's what it comes down to. It's a scary world out there, but do the best you can, take these simple steps, and by and large, you can protect yourself a great deal. Yeah, and it comes down to common sense. And it's just before you do anything, don't click, think things through. IRS isn't coming after you. Stay on your toes. So Steve, this is great. I know we could have spent another couple hours digging into some of these scams. I uh, really appreciate it. And I'm sure I'll be in touch with you when we find new ones from our clients and uh, appreciate all the good work you're doing. And thanks so much for being on the show today. Oh, I really enjoyed it and be happy to do it again. Wonderful. Well, listeners, stay tuned later this month for a brand new episode of Your Wealth and Beyond. Happy planning, everybody. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Your Wealth and Beyond. To get access to all the resources mentioned during today's podcast, please visit Baintree.com forward slash podcast. And be sure to tune in later this month for another episode of Your Wealth and Beyond. Investment advice is offered through Baintree Wealth Advisors, LLC, a registered investment advisor. Insurance and annuity products are offered separately through Baintree Planning Group, LLC. Baintree is not permitted to offer and no statement made during this show shall constitute legal or tax advice. You should talk to a qualified professional before making any decisions about your personal situation. 